Okay, so last time we left off, we were talking about the top-down stepwise refinement process as a tool, as a tactic, as a strategy that will allow us to go ahead and uh, um, design our pseudocode. Because one of the most challenging things, especially for junior level developers, people who are just starting to code out, is how do you take your ideas? How do you take the thing you want to accomplish and sufficiently build it into the step-by-step -step directions to actually implement as software? And so we saw one way to do that is we start with that top down, we, we start with the top statement, which is the very abstract thing you want to do, it doesn't contain any concrete details. And effectively, we end up using that as our header comment, right? So every time you make a class file now, it should always have a multi line comment that includes your top statement that defines what is the role and responsibility of this class, and also who is the author of this class. So moving forward, whenever you turn in the homework to the zombie game or any homework thereafter, you should always make sure that you have an author attached to it and that each class has a header comment. Then after that, we did our refinement process where we added a little bit of information and a little bit of information until finally we got to our last refinement which represents our complete pseudocode that we can then map one-to-one -to, -one to our Java statements, right? So does everyone kind of recall that? And that, that should be posted on YouTube already. So we last left off, if I remember correctly, talking about trying to design a calculator. And so our top statement was to solve a mathematical expression from text. And then we gave some examples. We, we stepped through each of these examples and we might not actually do most of these. Like, I think this actual example comes, or you have something like this similar to tab. So we won't do the last three of these in today's example. I'll leave that as a challenge for when you do that lab exercise, but we'll do these other ones here, the, these examples that we did in class. So I think what I did was I tasked you to see if you can't design your own Pseudo code for this. Did everyone go and do that over the course between Thursday to today, which is Tuesday? It's a four day period. Who thought deeply about this? Well, fortunately, I have slides. So we can go ahead and work this out. Oh, good. We had some people online who did. Okay. So, uh, Jonathan online, when we walk through this, I'd like to see if, oh, I did not say, <laughs> I misread that. Okay, well, for those of you who did, see if as we walk through this, how similar or dissimilar, what variety we had as we, as we step through this refinement process. I'd be interested to see if your approach to solving this problem is any different than my approach, and if we got to the same place on this. What? Okay, here we go. Okay, so... So the first thing we're going to do is, well, we already defined our top statement, right? Solve a mathematical expression from text. And then we actually gave some examples. This might not be a bad idea to start doing in the future as well, to so start thinking of concrete examples before you start the refinement process. So I might actually add this into my other slides as well. We talked about it in class and then I, I wrote these down, but then I came to the realization, this is a great way to illustrate what our expected input is and what our expected output is. And if you think about it, this is how the labs are designed as well, where each lab is a set of initial input values. And then you have an expected output value that you have to go ahead and compute in order to get credit for lab. So I think I'm gonna update my look very similar to this topic. So my first provide makes sense to you and for those of you who had already done this and thought of deeply of this, see if this is similar to your first refinement, that internet connection is unstable. Uh, so my refinement one was set up data, right? So the first thing I need to do is I need to set up the data model before I can start defining the algorithm that processes uh, on my data. So here I'm identifying what are, is the data that I start with, my initial state of my application, and then how do I have to process upon that until I can get to some concluding state? Uh, state. Uh, what is it that I'm trying to result from? 
Then the second thing is, well, I'm going to get that expression from the user. Once I've set up my data, I'm then going to get that text expression. And then the third and final thing is I'm going to resolve the expression and print it, right? That seems like, that seems like a reasonable set of steps uh, from my, my perspective. Does this seem, is this in line with, for those of you who have done this, was this your first refinement as well? Perfect. So just checking online, it looks like it, it, it is. So now let's go to the second refinement, because when I look at this refinement, I ask myself, is this pseudocode yet? And when, what I mean by pseudocode is, is this explicit enough for me to convert directly into some concrete programming language? The beautiful thing about pseudocode is that it's expressive, it's human readable, but it's concrete enough that we can translate it into Java code or Python code or C++ code or whatever programming, specific programming language we can use, we can easily map it. So it's kind of a generic coding language that doesn't actually compile to anything, but it allows us to express our algorithm in a way that makes sense and allows us to then transcribe it into any language that we wanna go ahead and, uh, and actually encode it to compile. Okay, so this is not quite done yet. So we're gonna to go to a second refinement. And just like what we did last class, I'm gonna take the first statement in refinement one, and I'm going to expand it to include more details. So for each statement on the left, on the right-hand side, I'm gonna have a table that corresponds to it on the right, uh, on the left-hand side, wait, yeah. For each statement on the right-hand side, I'm going to go ahead and have a table on the left-hand side that shows the expansion of it in the next refinement. So when I said set up data, I asked myself, what does that actually mean? Uh, well, we got to declare a variable for a left-hand operator. We have to declare a variable for the right-hand operator. I mean, operand. Uh, we got to declare a variable for the operator itself. And we have to initialize a scanner object to go ahead and get the input. In fact, we can also go ahead and say, we also need to declare a variable for the result. And so that would represent my initial state of my application here, all of this would be the initial state. And then here, this is what I'm expecting to output. And then what my algorithm is intended to do is how do I get from my initial state to my resulting state? So here, I'm gonna look at my next statement, get the expression from the user. Well, what do I have to do to get that? Well, the first thing I have to do is I have to prompt the user. Then I'm going to get the left-hand operand. I'll get the operator itself, and then I'm gonna get the right-hand operand because if we go back and look at our example, we see it is a numerical value, the operator, which is gonna be a string value, and then a numerical value. So we're gonna to wanna to parse that in the order that it's given to us. And then that seems to be everything we need to do for that second statement in refinement one. So then I'm gonna to move to my third statement, resolve the expression and print it. Here, I will calculate the results and then print that result. Now, when I look at refinement two, I see I'm much closer to having pseudocode. In fact, if I look at it at a block at a time, I could say block one looks well-defined enough for me to express that in Java code if I like. So that is that is hit pseudocode. Block two, I can prompt the user. That's a sit, that's an output statement. Get the uh, left-hand operand. That's a call to my scanner object and then a storage operation. I could do that in Java. Uh, get the operator from the user. That's a call to my scanner object and a storage operation. So I, I know I can do that and get the right-hand operand from the user. Same as before, right? It's a call to my scanner object and a storage operation. So block two, I feel confident enough that I've defined this such that I can now encode it as Java code. Now, when I look at block three, calculate the result, that's still abstract. 
that's still too general. I can't directly map that into a concrete set of uh, Java statements. So I'm going to have to think deeply on that, on how to express that. Uh, print the result. Well, that is a uh, output operation. So I could do that. one. So up to this point, is this effectively what uh, refinement two had looked like? For those of you who had worked on that. So I'm going to make a decision now that I have to go through at least one more refinement process. So I'll take refinement two and I'll use that as my starting point. And then I'll examine those parts that are too general and I'm going to expand those. So in this instance, I've highlighted the one statement that needs more expansion. And so inside block three, when I say calculate the result, what I mean by that is I have to inspect the symbol that's given to me and make a decision on what kind of arithmetic operation we're going to perform. So if our operator is a plus symbol, then we would perform addition. If the operator is a dash symbol, we would perform subtraction. If the operator is an asterisk symbol, we would perform multiplication. And if the operator is a slash symbol, then we would perform division. And so after that, we would be able to use the result we're looking for. And so now we're in a scenario where we can go ahead and encode this directly. We finally, refinement three is at a stage where we can map directly from our pseudocode into our Java code or map directly from our, our set of statements to Java code. So we've hit pseudocode. Okay, is there any questions about this? We've done this, I know, two times before. So this is time to join you the process and repetition. Hopefully it becomes easier and easier for you to be able to follow along as well to try to perform this. And again, I'm assuming the labs are really challenging you this, right? Do you see how this same process that we're doing here can be used to derive solutions in the labs? And it gives you a set of building blocks to start with something simple and build into something more complex. Okay. So let's talk about now translating our pseudocode into our um, Java code. And so on the left-hand side here, I have my pseudocode. And on my right-hand side, I actually have a Java, I actually have my Java uh, file. And so notice the top statement here is my header comments. So it gives me a description of the class and it shows me who the author of this document is. Then of course, all of my methods have to go into a class. So I'm going to create a class and all of my statements, all my algorithms have to go into a method. So for now, we're just going to have the main method. So inside of block one, where we declare our variables, we declare uh, for our initial state and we declare our variables for our end state, which I should put here. Declare variable for result. And then let's move this down so it doesn't over and move that down a little. And let's just perfect. Okay. So we see block one is defined here. And we'll look at this in the code editor in just a moment. Uh, but while I have it side by side, I can show my block one. I use those comments here, and then I actually implement it into Java here. And so with block two, I use the comments here, and I implement it into my Java code here. And then finally, in my block three, I have my comments here, and I implement it into my Java code here. So I actually use my pseudocode as my line-by-line -line comments that then defines what every line of my code does. So let's go into the actual source code document so we can actually see. I, I will increase the size to make it a little bit readable. Is that a little bit better in terms of readability for everybody? Okay, so again, I take the top statement and make it the header comment. And so here, this is what this, so when I say I'm gonna declare my variables for my left-hand operand and my right-hand operand, I'm going to use good naming conventions to represent what those data values are supposed to model. So if I say in English that this is my left-hand operand and my right-hand operand, I'm gonna use variables 
that represent that, that makes what we call self-documenting code. So that even without these line by line comments, the code is still incredibly readable. You still understand what it is this variable in particular models inside this application. So we have left hand, we have right hand, we have operator. These two things are numerical data. This is a string data. We're gonna set up a scanner object. And then finally, we're gonna create an integer value that will be able to hold our result. Then on the second block, we're going to, and just for readability's sake, I'm gonna create a local variable just called prompt so that I can define what my prompt is as a string. And then I'll just pass that variable into my system.out.print statement. And then that's my prompt. So then after which the user should supply a mathematical expression, we define a mathematical expression as one that has a left operand, which is a numerical value. So we're going to do next int, followed by a space, followed by a string that is a symbol that represents the mathematical operation we wish to perform. So we will save that as a string, followed by a space, followed by another numerical value, which will be the right-hand operand. Okay, once we do that, we're going to do use the switch statement. Now we could have done this in one of two ways, right? It's a multi-selection operation we're doing because it's gonna depend on the symbol that we get from the user to decide whether we're gonna do addition or subtraction or division or multiplication. So in this instance, I will use a switch operation, but I'll show you that it is equally valid to also use an if else if block, right? So here, if we wanted to do this as a switch statement, we can go ahead and switch on operator. That's the thing we're trying to match against to make a decision on what type of operation we're going to perform. So the operation recall is a string symbol. So on the case that the string symbol is the plus sign, and then I'm going to use the arrow operator. Recall the arrow, arrow operator is the new form that we can use to define our switch statements, where we avoid having to use break statements. This was introduced, I want to say, in Java 14, and this is the way you want to do switch statements. Now, your textbook only goes up to Java 8, so it does not show you this syntax. So I want you to use this syntax moving forward as opposed to what the textbook says. In fact, if you use the Oracle API documentation, it will illustrate that you should use the newer formats of the switch statement over the older format. Okay, with that said, this is an arrow operator. So this essentially says on the instance that we match this case, it points to this code block. So this code block starts here, it ends here. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to, puff, we're going to compute the result, which is going to be the addition of the left hand integer to the right hand integer and then we're going to print out the result so we'll display it as a string okay so if it wasn't a plus sign that was the operator then we'll say okay on the case of a dash symbol we'll do subtraction and then print out that result and then we'll then we'll do some multiple cases for multiplication because multiplication might use multiple symbols we might use the asterisk but we could just as validly use the lowercase x symbol, right? Because when I asked, when I showed you the example, everyone intuitively thought of this as multiplication, right? Same thing with the big X. So on the instance that any one of these cases occur, we want to perform the same operation. So if we want to match more than one value to a block of code in a switch statement, I can separate it with a comma separated list. So notice that's what I'm doing here. On the case of lowercase x, comma, case of uppercase x, comma, case of asterisk, on any one of those instances, I will do that code block of multiplication. Finally, I'll do the case of, well, I'm missing one here. The case of slash, a forward slash, or a um, backslash. Oh. To the, do the backslash though, remember, uh, or the forward slash, that's the forward slash. To so do the forward slash, that's a special symbol when it's embedded in a string for an escape code, right? So normally when I put a, a, a forward slash, I'd have to put an N or a T, right? That when, when the system sees that forward slash, it's like, oh, you're gonna give me some meta information. 
So if I actually want to use a forward slash, I can't just have one of them. I have to have two of them. Does that make sense? Because it itself is a special symbol. It's the same thing, like if I wanted to have a double quotation in a string, since double quotation usually terminates a string, I could put the escape key in there, the escape character, and then I could do that. And notice it highlights that entire character bright red. You see how this is bright right here. And then that mauve color, that dark red, shows where my string starts and ends in my syntax higher. So anything that is either a meta formatting instruction, like a new line character or a tab character, or if it's a special symbol for managing string data types inside of Java, like a uh, double quotation or the forward slash, you have to use the forward slash before using that symbol. So a forward slash would be forward slash, forward slash, a double quotation would be uh, forward slash quotation. So let me go back and put that. Okay, so now when it says double quotation forward, uh, um, um, what happened to my uh, chat? Okay, there we go. So when it says uh, forward uh, uh, slash there twice, it just really means once. It's only going to treat that for the one symbol. Okay, so is there any questions related to that? Or is that clear? And then we have a default. So if it's none of these things, then we'll say, okay, then we're going to print out a value to the user that, hey, that is not a valid operator. So let's actually try to run this. So is there any questions about this implementation based off of our pseudocode that we created? Okay. So let's go ahead and run this. So this was called calculator.java. Let's go ahead and compile that and now we will run. So enter a main expression, separate it by spaces. So we were going to say, what was the example? We did two plus three, right? That was our first example. Should we go back to the examples? Let's go back to the examples, refresh our memory. So based off of our sample input, we're going to use that as our test case to see if this is implemented the way we expect it to be. So this was our top statement where we gave example initial and then what the expected result would be. So on the uh, on the um, left hand side, we have what we start, and on the right hand side, we have what we'd expect our application to deliver. So we're going to do two plus three, we're going to expect five, two minus three, we're going to expect one, two asterisk three, we're going to expect six, two X three, we're going to expect six, two upper X three, we're going to expect six, two backslash three, zero, two forward slash three, zero, and we're, we didn't implement these other ones, so we're going to ignore those. I would bit up to you to ignore these additional symbols. Be very similar uh, conceptually. Okay. So let's go and try that out. So if two plus three, we get two plus three is equal to five. So let's run that again. Two minus three. Two minus three is equal to minus one. Two X three. Yeah. Two upper X three. Yeah. Two asterisk three. Two. Uh, backslash three or forward slash. I don't ever remember which of those it is. Okay. And I think that's it. Okay, perfect. Let's see, I have a question. Any update on the torturing? I have no idea what that means. Triggering. Huh? Triggering. Oh, <laughs> I could see how they can be confused though. <laughs> Um, yes, tutoring starts uh, the 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 um, the schedule's now out, and I believe it starts this week. So you should be able to, and I'll, I'll have to double check, but I want to say it starts. If it doesn't start this week, it starts at the beginning of next week. So it's uh, the tutoring office is in three nineteen upstairs on the third floor of the math building. 
I have it posted. I have, I should update my Moodle with the new schedule, but I do have the new schedule posted in the announcement section of our Discord. So if you go to the Discord server, if you go into the announcements uh, channel, the new schedule for when tutoring is available, it should be posted there. And it might be actually uh, the beginning of next week when the tutors are actually inside the office. No, they should not be open at midnight. Oh, that's, oh. Yeah. There, that it should be kind of like from afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Well, computer science people are renowned for their night schedule. <laughs> okay, perfect. So this is works exactly as we'd expect. Is there any question about this implementation as we're using it here with the uh, with the switch statement? Now, I want to highlight that we could do the same implementation. This would not affect our pseudocode at all if we wanted to use the if else if blocks. So what that would look like would be this. So if I want to convert between those two, let's see what changes. We see that here, our data models, the data that represents our initial state, the data that re represents our ending state is the same. We can see here that the way it, that we go ahead and get that data into our application remains the same. The only thing that's going to change is the multi-selection statement itself. And notice if I wanted to move from the, and let me get it here. If I want to move from the, oh no, not here. Let me do here. If I want to move from the switch operation, here's the switch operating where I'm switching on this operator symbol. I could just do a set of if else statements as well. And this does, this will, perform the exact similar set of operations and execute to you, the end user, exactly the same. So even though the implementation is different, you wouldn't realize whether I'm using a switch statement or an if else if block, right? I... Okay, so here, for instance, I would start my initial if statement where I would evaluate to see if the operator equals the plus sign, and then I would perform that block. Notice that would be exactly the same as this case here, right? So in the case that the operator equals plus sign, we do that. Else if, because a switch statement represents a multi-selection statement, not an independent set of if uh, statements. So else if, the symbol was a dash, we'd operate, we do this operation. So again, this would be akin to this block here. Then here, operator equals X, or then we're going to use the logical operator, because remember, this resolves into a Boolean expression. So if it equals the small X, or if it equals the large X, or if it equals an asterisk, that's the same as trying to determine if it's all these cases, small X, large X, or asterisk, then we would do the multiplication. And then here we get this to be in the same format. So, or, Or if the operator is equal to the forward slash or the backslash, so that's the same as this block here. And then finally, we have the default block. If it's not any of those cases, then we're going to report, oh, we never tried to test that out either. Let's say we do two question mark three, right? Well, then we're going to get the result, hey, question mark is not a valid operator. Well, the the equivalent of a default case on switch inside our if else if block is going to be the else. So in fact, if I go into my code here, let's clear this out. And if we compile our switch if.java state uh, uh, file and run that and test it out, we'll see that the behavior is going to be exactly the same. Okay, what do we have here? 
Uh, switch if, switch if. Uh, oh, whoops, I got to use Java. There we go. Okay, so let's see here. So we do two plus three. Yep. And then two times three. Oh, no, no, two minus three. Yep. And then two X three. Two big X three. Two asterisk three. Two divide three. Two divide three with both slashes. And then finally, two question mark three. So notice from our perspective, they perform exactly the same from the end user. So, and so let me ask you this, is there a preference? And this is just a personal preference from what you see. Do you prefer the if else block or do you prefer the, um, the uh, switch statement block? Either way is valid and it's up to you which one you'd wanna do. Now, again, they both have their own shortcomings. They both have their both um, uh, advantages. So say for instance, the advantage of the multi-selection statement is that I can go ahead and uh, not only test for uh, equality, because that's what switch statements are restricted to. They can only test for equality. Uh, the multi-selection statements using if else if blocks can check for relational operations or anything else, right? That can resolve into a uh, expressive Boolean value. Switch statements are exclusively uh, equality, but they can do something interesting that multi uh, nested switch statements can't, that a nested block can't. And I'm gonna show you what that is in just a moment. Oh my goodness. Actually, I wanna turn this off. <laughs> it's going to... Oh, I don't know how to turn that off. because that's going to cause havoc on. Wait, can I? Okay, there, we can just move that. <laughs> okay, so with that said, let's take a look here at uh, what the advantage of a switch statement is that we can't do with a selection statement. It's actually possible, and let me actually show you here, where I can yield a value from a switch statement, which I can't necessarily do with a, uh, if else, if statement. So what does it mean where I can yield a value? It means that I can actually take one of the values that are selected in the switch statement and then return it back to the parent block of code. So remember the way that the code scopes work is whenever I declare a variable, whenever I process a result inside of a code block and code blocks are defined by the curly braces, right? The open close curly braces. After I hit the closing brace, any variables that are declared in that block are thrown away, right? They don't carry over. You don't maintain them. So that's why in some instances, when we're doing repetition statements, we were declaring variables outside the repetition state, right? Does everyone remember that? Let me get my uh, chat back up here. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so let me show you how we can take a value from one code block and give it to an outer code block in the same method. We can use the yield keyword in order to transfer data from one code block to another. So if I go to switch here, this is what I'm going to do with this switch statement is notice instead of on line 15, where I had int result, I'm going to presume that the output is supposed to be a string and it's gonna be the statement, the mathematical expression that also includes the result. Okay, so if that's the case, I can go ahead and use the switch statement as if it's a statement itself to resolve a result. 
So notice here, I can do output and assignment. So whenever I do an assignment operation, recall that the assignment operation, the single equal sign requires a variable to be on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is a value or an expression that resolves to be a value. So the Swiss statement can actually give back, it can yield back a singular value that I can then assign into my output variable. So what I'm going to do, so what it means is that it's going to figure out a value internally inside one of these code blocks, but it's going to yield it back to its parent block. So in this instance, we're going to switch. It looks exactly the same as before. We're going to switch on the operator. On the case of a yield, I mean, the case of a plus sign, I'll go ahead and use a local variable for result. So recall result in this instance is declared inside this code block here. Then I'm going to use this method inside of string. So string is a class. We always get string imported into every Java application because it's part of package java.util. One of the methods that string provides is string.format that allows us to do a formatted string, a print, the same as printf. So this is the same as printf, but instead of sending it directly to the output stream, we can actually build a string around it. Does that make sense? So in this instance, notice the parameters are going to look the exact same that I would use for a printf statement. So I would so the first argument is going to be a formatted string where I can put those placeholder values. In this instance, it would be percent %d, percent %s, percent %d is uh, then the 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 assignment operator, the equal sign if this is math a math expression, and then percent %d. So again, what that's supposed to express is a, numer a numerical value that is an integer. The symbol, the string is a uh, our symbol, our mathematical symbol, followed by another numerical value, which is going to be an integer. And then we'll have the equal sign in math and assignment operator in Java. Fin finally, the um, last percent D is going to be a numerical value that is an integer. And then this is our new line character. Okay, so this is going to produce a string. When I produce this string, notice I'm going to use the keyword yield. This is a statement itself because it terminates with a semicolon. And what this is going to do is it's going to effectively give this value back. It's going to send this data out when the switch operation is done to the outer block. So this, this is one way we can process data inside of one block and then give it to another block. But the, the trick is it has to give it to the block in the same method. Does this, is this fine? This concept of yield. And so for each statement that I potentially want to yield out of my switch statement, I'm going to have a yield attached to it. So this is the yield for the plus operation. This is the yield for the minus operation. This is the yield for the multiplication operation. This is the yield for the division operation. And this is the yield for the default. And so what I want you to see here is that we can go ahead and compile this and test this, and it's going to look exactly the same as what we're doing before. So if I do two, two plus three, it's going to say two plus three is equal to five. Where is it actually printing this out at? It's not printing it out inside of the switch statement anymore. It's actually printing it out on line 47 after the switch statement is done. So actually, this way, I think, is a little bit cleaner because instead of doing the printing and the computing in the same block, I'm computing the result, and then I have a separate line of code that then prints the result based off of the computation. So it allows me to separate those two concepts to be their own lines of code. And so this is an advantage that we can do with the numerous to wish statements that we can't get from the if else. So I just want to highlight that there's a give and take here. You have more flexibility in what you can assess using the if else if blocks, but you have the capability to yield values out of a switch statement. So keep that in consideration 
often when you have to make a decision on which of these two multi-selection structures to use. Is there any questions related to this? Excellent. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, and let me make sure that there's no questions from the chat. Okay, so since there's no questions related to this, I'm done with unit one now. We've talked about everything we need to for what we're gonna call algorithm design. And so again, going all the way back to the beginning, what that effectively means is we covered what it means to think mathematically, how to model our observations or the phenomena of the world around us in terms of quantitative data and qualitative data, how to build a set of, uh, how to then express our initial problem domain as an initial state of data. Then once we have a data model that's suitable, we've learned how to start talking about algorithms, which is a set of step-by-step -step directions on how to mutate our initial state of data into whatever our desired outcome is and how we can go ahead and plan out our algorithm using this top-down stepwise refinement process so that we can start with something very abstract and evolve it into our pseudocode that we can then map to our Java code. And we learned that our building blocks for any Java algorithms are based off of five different types of operations. Those are input operations, output operations, storage operations, our processing operations, and our control operations, right? So is there, is there any questions related to this? Because what this means now that we're, uh, we're moving out of unit one is that we can start talking about the first test. So the first test is going to be like all other tests in this class, a take-home test. I will probably make it live now that we are done this, uh, the moment that the first homework is due. So I, I always like to ensure that we finish the homework related to the unit that we're in. So the zombie homework, right? I have that due this Thursday, correct? This Friday? Okay. The zombie homework is due Friday. And it has you using all of the constructs that we learned, right? It has storage operations. It has um, input operations. It has output operations. It has uh, processing operations. And it has two different types of control or three different types of control operations, right? It has the uh, selection operations and repetition operations, and it has both types of repetition operations, the counter controlled and the sentinel controlled using for loops and while loops, correct? So it effectively covers the entire gambit of everything we've covered since we started the semester. So it's a good capstone homework to illustrate where we should be at after today's lecture. Now, you not only have to follow that code, and has everyone looked at that by chance? Has everyone, is, is anyone having issues following that? 